All right, Melanie. Melanie, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Yeah, originally Chicago and Indianapolis, those two cities. And tell me about your family. My family, okay. My father worked at General Motors and he was out here in LA in the 70s and like parts of the 80s, that type of thing. And then after that happened, it's like, you know, with GM, they kind of forced everybody out. So what he was trying to do is stay within the Cali region, which kind of just didn't work out in his favor because they were telling him, you got to go here, go here. We're giving you a list of choices, narrowed it down. And that's when they forced him to Kansas City. And that's where I was born. What was your relationship like with your parents? <laughs> with my parents was kind of like hectic, like my father in particular like per se, was more like the movie Blow, Boston George, like a functioning alcoholic. So I had to deal with that. And then later on, finding out the drug use that he had. So that like explained everything, you know, for the thesis of the story of why it was never nothing to eat in the refrigerator coming home. And you have a parent that has a good job, car, all that, but it's never nothing in the fridge. And then sometimes rent would be doing and you'd be struggling with that too. And my mother was more of the type that was an enabler. Long as she had to, like toxicity and drama stirred up within her realm, she was happy. Like that's, she put everybody against each other. So it was like that. And I was kind of like raised by my uncle, which when we left Kansas City to Indianapolis and then that's when like things didn't work. So they shipped me to Chicago with my uncle. So like with that, it was like chaotic in the 90s because like you couldn't be like how I am now. And so my brother, I was stuck with him. Any tra transgender? Yeah, I couldn't do none of that. I was already like dibbling, dabbling in it, playing with my mother's pantsuits, all that, taking her shoulder pads out, making a gaff out of it for that nail polish. I was doing like everything. But, you know, in the 90s, when we moved away from Kansas City and then to Indianapolis, like I said, in Chicago, fights break out the gangs, vice lords, gangster disciples, all that. Like, I'd never seen none of that until I got to that part of the country and it was like serious. You had to learn how to fight and like survive every day. Yeah, Chicago's rough. Very rough, like, I mean, it's the belly of the beast, honestly. It's like, you gotta like jump off the porch immediately. Eight, nine years old, I've done that. So like, you gotta find a way, like, left home alone all throughout the nights, watching myself. Like my mother, she was selective on who she cherished and loved. Like majority of my brothers and sisters, all of them were born out here in Cali, Southern Cali. Like my brother is Harbor City, my sister, Linwood. Then I have another sister. Like I said, she was born in Fresno, so. You, you kind of realized that you were trans at an early age? Yeah, I did. Like kind of everybody noticed that. My aunties noticed that and they were like, Telling my father, was like, you need to get that one with the tie-dye and the underwear and like playing with Care Bears and stuff like that. But I could never express it because like the ridicule, the backlash, the mayhem. And then like you would be fighting coming home from school and to school and nobody wants to hear your story. So, I mean, what are you gonna do? You think your sexual orientation um, comes from something that happened to you or you were born this way? More like I already knew when I was a kid, something did happen, like with a relative, a cousin, they left me with, um, you know, like stuff kind of went on from there. I kind of fended off for a little bit. So, I mean, that kind of happened a little bit. That was like when I was about nine. Like we'd be left in the house by ourselves, and then my cousin was probably like five years older than me. And you've been driving a truck for how long now? Okay, let's see. I've been driving a truck for about like literally, it's going to be three years within about like three months. You'll drive all over the country? Yeah, that will have you going coast to coast. And like I said, that's very dangerous. Like the dynamics of trucking is like very, it's set up for where all the companies make money for themselves. And it's like a pimping industry because they only give the drivers a little bit. Like you should get a percentage and in charge of the driver load board, picking your own loads. So you can go ahead and see where you want to drive and pre-plan yourself. Instead, they have a driver manager, it's called a dispatcher, barely knows anything about the fucking business. And literally, they go home, 
<laughs> don't care about you, mess the load up. They can have you picking up a load. It's called like a repower. You just go pick up a load that's late delivery and they never reschedule anything. So you might get to the place and mind you, tight ass roads or back roads, dangerous as shit. And they, they'll give you the wrong address. Now you gotta figure out where to go. And they won't pick up and night dispatch is the worst because if you call them, half of the time they don't care and they don't know because they don't correspond. It's like the communication is very shot within trucking. And that's why drivers have quit after a while because like zero experience. And you're from one side of the country, like the Midwest, and you want me to drive all the way, like to Seattle, Portland, going up the Cascades and people have never seen that in wintertime and they get scared. And they don't know how to like deal with it, with the anxiety, all that. And they put a lot in front of you and they really don't care. Like, it's just, they wanna say you have to have experience going up and down mountains and driving over TR, which is over the road. And that's a lie because you can get hired and do local, but they don't tell you nothing. They want you to come in as a company driver, which is like slave for peanuts for them. Two years experience, want to give you 48 cents per mile or something like that close to it when you should be getting 55 cents per mile or 60. And then some of them don't put APUs in the truck, which those are outlets to where you can plug in stuff that you need. And that is like kills everything. And then they have an idle policy on some of these companies where they only want you idling in the truck for a little bit and it's hot as shit. And like, what am I going to do, burn up in the truck? It's like crazy. And they don't clean these trucks neither. That's another thing like, I have a problem with. They put you in a truck that got bed bugs. I've been through that four times in 2021. I drove from Rancho Cucamonga all the way to San Antonio, getting bit the fuck up when Texas had that winter storm. I think it was 2020. I was just trying to haul my ass back home, um, get to San Antonio. That's where I was living at the time. It was chaotic. I'm like, they don't give you a personal convenience, which that's a button if all your drive time is out because you got 70 hours to drive, period, for the week. 14 hours. You can't push the limits of... Oh, no, they will. They'll try to violate, but here's the... I'm, I'm going to get into that next. And you got 11 hours to drive straight, and they really feel like you should just sit in the fucking seat all day and take no breaks and drive 11 hours in total. Like, no, I need to get the fuck off this truck before I lose my mind, and that's exactly what happens the majority of the time. And people, like, get frantic and quick because, you know, you got all types of things... People cutting you off, cutting in the lane, you can't get over, you're in a brand new city. I'm gonna say like the shittiest ones are Dallas and Atlanta, cause they go like this and it's hard to navigate and you're stuck in traffic. And people will like park the truck on the side of the road and quit, like especially with the bed bugs because you gotta replace everything. They don't reimburse you, they don't care. They know the trucks are nasty. And then on top of that, um, like they just say you go wash and dry your clothes. I'm like, fuck, really? You gonna reimburse me for that? No, they don't even do that. So, I mean, trucking is brutal unless you're an owner operator. You gotta save up all your ends, figure it out, lease purchase maybe. You know, you renting a truck through their company, which is still making them a shit ton of money and they're getting profit and gross while you're just getting increments. And they lie also about, I wanna say, what is it they lie about the most? Really home time, that's one of them. That's why a lot of us park the truck quick because they want you out on the road three to four weeks. And before you want to go home, they always give you an extra stop way out of the way. And then um, the other thing that makes people quit is uh, the benefits suck. I want to say, they always want to say it's a bonus. But the bonus, they break it down in increments. First check, you get maybe 500. Next check, within 60 days, if you stay, see all this is stretched out over a period of time so they can have driver retention, you know? So they don't, their turnover rate's not high. And that's the games they play in trucking and they really don't care about drivers and drivers are in and out the door. Then you want to go independent and drive for somebody like I've Indeed or Glassdoor. But the catch to that is they do 1099. So now you're paying for every fucking thing out of your pocket. Taxes included. You got to do the whole bracket and it's like, damn, you get no benefits. And the day you quit as a company driver, they literally cut your fucking insurance off that damn fucking day. And that's what like killed me. It's like, I'm trying to really get my life together using trucking. I did it because like, I'm on child support for a kid that's not mine, which that's my foster brother's kid. Like to get in that, that's messy. Kind of reason why I gave up on dealing with women in general. Like it was just hectic and chaotic and nothing you ever do enough is good enough for them. That's what I'm trying to say. They always find something bitch complain about this, that, the third. 
And I'm, you know, the worst thing you can do is really raise somebody else's kid because you have no jurisdiction. Especially where I'm at, you know what I'm talking about. They let the kids run all over you, be in a grocery store, sliding with slippers and cussing them out. Come on, Ray Ray, Pookie, this, that, man. Like, it's crazy. I got tired of it. I was in that, this relationship, literally, I want to say nine years. It was toxic as hell. I wish I would have saved myself and got out earlier. But, you know, when somebody has a kid and then, boom, have another one, what are you going to do, run out on her while the kid's a little? That's I was like, nah. But, I don't know, that's kind of like my story with them, you know, going into trucking for their child support. And that's my first kid's mom. Like, literally, I was like scared. I was 19, 2005, like, how do I get off child support? I don't know how. Do I like go down to the dungeon? That's what I call it, because it's all the way in the basement. Like, Indianapolis is jail and stuff. It's set up where you gotta go all the way underground, even to walk to court. So I'm like, I don't know what papers they was pushing in my face, signed, whatever. I thought it was maybe signed for paternity or what, and so I ended up on the hook for that. And I was literally in Job Corps trying to like get my life together then and get a trade, which I did obtain, like plastering and drywall. It, it wasn't what I wanted because everything was filled up. I just took what I could. But when I came home, this is how I knew this was messed up with the foster kid. My mother picked me up, dropped me off, whatever. The foster kid was in my father's room, laid out on the bed. And as I'm looking, I'm like, what is this person doing? You know? He was sitting there like butt ass naked in her bed and like his drawers, whatever. I'm like, okay, so y'all two fucking. So not only he fucked my baby mama at the time, whatever, and he fucked my mama too, so I'm like, Immediately, we started like fighting and stuff like that. Cause she always used the foster kids for money, really didn't give a fuck about them, period. And like, that's what it was. They were her cash cow and like, it, it was what it was. And she really didn't want me because she had eight or nine abortions. I figured that game playing out too with her, literally. Are drugs a part of your life? Really drugs, I've never like dived into. My drug of choice would be that liquor store. Like anything like vodka, everybody like knows me, knows that I can drink down some shit very quickly. Like, but you know, in my part of the country, it's a liquor store on every corner. You can't just not walk and run into one. Where, where do you live? Right now? No, right now I'm in the Bronx, New York. Oh, yeah. But Chicago, where I grew up at, between that and Indianapolis, is like liquor stores literally on every freaking corner you walk to, that corner, that corner. So it's like you can't escape it. It's designed to keep you trapped. Are you happier as a woman? Yeah, definitely. I'd have to figure like majority of it out because like being trans, you get ridiculed, people wreck you through the coals, give you dirty looks, whatever. Sometimes you look like, huh, it's this person looking at me a funny way, like am I trans or they gonna say something? And sometimes like they do say things and out of the way if you're having a bad day and you're not like coordinated, right? Got everything together, like dot your T's and stuff and they notice it and nitpick with you or say something out of the blue and you really try to keep your calm composure. But like sometimes you just go off and it just happens. Like with me, I don't know how I really didn't go off on anybody yet. I try to like stay in my own little realm world, but mentally it has exhausted me. I just want to get somewhere where I can be like helped, you know, all that and figure out me, like where the other trans are at that kind of like show you the ins and outs of do's and don'ts of like, cause I just started transitioning in 2021, 20, the beginning. You're taking hormones? Yeah, I'm taking hormones, all that. I'm trying to save up. That's what I was using trucking for, like for that. But sometimes I get burned out with trucking and then like, where am I gonna go to move to? Because I was living off the truck. That was the bit, that was like my shelter. Wherever the truck went, I went. And then when I had to get off because I'm mentally fatigued, because the last company had me out 60 days straight and lied and said they was gonna send me home, never did. And um, long story short, they had bed bugs in that damn truck. And she said I was the reason why the bed bugs was brought in because I went to Walmart and bought the mattress. I'm like, damn, every time you buy stuff, get comfortable with trucking, boom, it's a problem. You end up leaving, and most truckers get mad about this. They know this. They done left so much shit on that damn truck and lost so much money they invested in. And I'm like, it ain't worth them losing more money than I'm making. And if, like, 
you keep doing that, like Celadon is one of them. It's a big ass company. Everybody that's watching this will tell you this. They shut everything down. They had some type of big ass scheme they were stealing and not paying taxes and everything else. So they just shut everything down, left drivers stranded. They'll do that. Leave you stranded. They cut off the fuel cards, cut off everything. People were scrambling all the way across the country, didn't even know how to get back in remote towns like Montana. I know some people were in Tennessee and they're from over this way. And they were like, I don't know how I'm gonna get back, like seriously. And some of the driver managers at the time would laugh and they would think that was funny. So yeah, trucking is complicated, very, unless you own that truck. And even if so, the fuel economy is so damn bad, it kind of forced you to quit. Is it hard to save money? Trucking, yeah, because it's designed like to take away from you. I mean, let's be serious. Loves, Pilot, TAs, all these truck stops, high shit if you got to eat pretty much from that. I mean, it's like 25 damn dollars each meal. It's expensive. Then they want to pimp you on the parking. You can't park here. You got to pay $20. And it's like you got to keep riding around. Sometimes even you get out this way, it's 40. And I'm like, damn, you just keep losing money. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And even if you buy stuff for the truck, that's another thing you might need. Cushions, because when you ride, you just can't ride in that seat. Your back don't wire. You got to get the back piece. The companies don't even issue those things out. They, you would think they would go ahead and give you all this for the driver to be comfortable. Going up and down raggedy ass mountains, the Appalachians, from which I've seen in your interviews, you should know too. I hate that, like send you through Virginia. I've been in Virginia and I had the wrong GPS lady, like just to get this GPS. Um, she was like doing the orientation. This was out of Gary, Indiana. So I'm like, okay, cool. I did that. She said, yeah, this is one. Really didn't give a fuck. She just sent me on my way. I got up there to the back roads of VA, not knowing shit. It took me through some rinky-dink town. And I kept going up like this through the mountains. I'm like, ooh, shit, truck's prohibited. I'm like, I don't got no turnaround though, so what am I gonna do? I gotta ride it out. Went further up this shit. It looked like you was gonna enter the damn fucking drop zone at like Kings Island or you was on a roller coaster. This happens too, so I didn't notice this part. I got all the way up there. The truck just shut the fuck off on me, started rocking back and sliding back. I'm like, oh shit. I kicked the door open. I'm like, I'm about to jump, fuck this truck, fuck everything in the back. I'm done. They can have this shit. I don't care no more. I ain't worth me. I'm dying going over the cliff. And I'm like, shit, what am I gonna do though? I do need a CDL, cause what am I gonna go back to? Bell tire? Discount tire, changing tires, what I was doing before. <laughs> what, oil lube technician? I don't feel like doing that. A two man in the truck, I was doing these things. I don't wanna do that no more. So I'm like, let me figure this out. And I don't got that much time. So I pulled the brakes, tilted a little bit, which has stopped. And if it went further that way, it was going off the cliff. I'm like, shit, okay. I can't get reception. I'm all the way up in the hills. What the fuck do I do? Not to be funny, but I was like, okay, what do white people do in scary movies? They text 911. So I said, let me text them. I'm like, look, I'm stuck. I don't know where I'm at. Get out and look. I said, like hell, fuck. I ain't nothing up here but what, fox, wolves. And it really was. I'm looking at him. I'm not getting out, no. I'm like, black people I don't make it out of these scary situations. You know I'm not lying. I'm like, okay, I can't do it. So I called the company. They don't answer. They really don't give a fuck. It's just you, whatever. That's your problem. So the police finally did send somebody out there. They knew the area. Then he looked on the side, they sent a fuel truck, that's what it was, to get me, because I ran out of fuel, somebody siphoned my fuel out. In my first year of trucking, it's like I was a magnet. Owner operators, they're the main ones to steal and siphon your fuel. So they took all my damn fuel, I didn't know out of one tank, and that's why I ran the fuck out. And I literally was looking at the light, but sometimes when you've been driving on E, you have a long distance to go in that truck. And then as I thought the coast was, the coast was clear going down like that, taking up all the lanes because, I mean, literally, you don't have no room to, like, pretty much have distance to keep from going over. It all, shit happens at the end. So I got to the end thinking the coast was clear. Boom, hit a big railroad type thing. Smashed both of my drive tires, I think. Let me see, no trailer tires. It was the trailer, the back side of the trailers. Smashed them, rim bent to hell. I'm like, I knew something was wrong. Once again, like I'm telling you, I don't, I'm in this, field area. I don't want to get out. So I haul ass. I just seen a TA up the hill. I think that was a Petro, my fault. Petro. So I said, I'm hauling ass. I'm getting up there. Fuck this shit. I got to get up off this truck. So I hit the gas again, got up there. They changed everything. And like I said, from there, I was kind of free, but sometimes they'll put that on your record. Any accidents, any type of thing they can get, 
they put it on your record and try to like shit on you. So other drivers that's trying to get hired, it's like they have, I think it's an Intelli app and it's something else, your DAC report, that's what it is. So every time companies are looking at your DAC report, they want to see pretty much are you hireable? Is my insurance going to take you on? And it's the games you got to think in your head, like how do I stay safe and protect my fucking insurance? DLT is the police that pulls you over. They'll hit you as well. Illinois, the bottom half of Illinois going into St. Louis smacked me real bad. This was like, um, I was leaving San Antonio trying to get back to Indianapolis. I got lied to. I had family there that was like, oh, you can save money, move in with us. I'm like, shouldn't have did it. But I was ready to leave San Antonio because my landlord, I was pretty much renting a room because my credit so damn fucked up. Don't matter how much money I get, and I'm like, I got the money to pay the rent. Oh, well, I'm sorry, your credit, or they just make up some story. We'll mail you something. Just tell me I'm fucked up with credit. It's bad. Tell me I might as well go ahead and pitch a tent somewhere, or I mean, seriously, it's bad. So I don't like being lied to. And I know one way to check my credit. Go apply for little credit cards for big lots, any type of what? I want to say Kohl's, a department store. And if you don't get that, you know your credit's in the dump. So I already know, I'm like, okay, I can like leave San Antonio real quick because my landlord was messing with me anyway. Like, oh yeah, he's gay, this, that, and the third, and I can get him to do this and do that. Because I wasn't fully out, but I was like on my way to coming out. Some shit did happen to where like rent got behind and I had to mess with him in order to pay my fucking half. Like I was trying to keep my money on me to pay some of my debt off to clear this shit off so I can get my name good and pay the bank off, somebody else. And that's bad, because my mom used my credit up bad in my name and fucked it up, turned on a lot of shit in my name. She did a lot of foul shit to me. And then those that I'm a church godly woman, I bet so. I mean, you know, whatever, I just know you used my credit and messed my shit up. And I know you went to the church before too. I also fucked the pastor and don't want to mention that. <laughs> Seriously, like, they sent her home one day because her skirt was too short. I'm like, man, looking at my father at the time, I'm like, you a simp, you still with her. But I figured she puts up with his shit, and I don't know, he jacks off the money, mess with different type of women. And every time when I was a kid, he would use me as his um, go-to to be like, cover for me, why? Say I was doing this, I was doing that, even when I was a kid. Like, cover for him from cheating. Say the condoms in the truck was yours. All type of crazy shit. And get caught with calls and stuff on his phone, she would check it. I don't know, like, my middle name is Justin. Justin must have been on my phone. Justin did this. I'm like, nah, I didn't do shit. That was all you, but you need to take ownership of your fuck-ups, like, seriously. And even when I was a kid, he would blow his money and jack it off. I ain't got no money to smoke up the dope with him and his friends. He would show off and flex in front of his friends, like, take care of them more than he took care of his own family and kids, me. And I'm like, okay, cool. As a kid, you get money thinking you're gonna keep the money, but he would take the money from you and be like, I'll pay you back with interest. You ain't seeing that shit back for about five months. And that's for him and his friends to go get high and drunk and go trick off on whatever fucking crackhead bitch he can find. Knew that as a kid. I'm like, shit. That explains why I was in the streets running with gangs too. Like stealing, like boosting everything in sight. Cause you got to have it. Like you didn't want to be without, seriously. like. It was all bad, like, I was getting mad about it. You see other kids having a lot of stuff, and you looking. Of course, I know how to make fun of people good, but it don't make sense to make fun of somebody when you sitting over there looking raggedy and not having. So I just learned pretty much skill to trade from eight, nine, 10. Be a master thief, but no, never steal from your community, your people. You gotta have morals and concepts about it and virtues. So I was like, I'm just hit retail because they're insurance anyway, and um, Corporate America ain't gonna miss shit. That's how I looked at it. They're robbing from us, so let me take from them. Yeah, Melanie, that. What would you say is the most important lesson you learned in your life? The most important lessons is like protect your energy, protect like your peace of mind. And sometimes if things get too chaotic and you gotta get away and you gotta disappear to click, get a, like a peace of mind and collect everything again and find you again, do that because life is too short to be nice and trying to be there for people and they're not there for you so you got to watch everything including friends family because people like coming the devil in disguise they'll play you manipulate you then when they don't got a need for you they discard you like a dirty tampon and they out of your life like that and you somewhere stuck fucked up 
and that's life. That's how it goes. It's like you got to play them before they play you. All right, Melanie, thank you so much for sharing your story. No problem. Be careful driving out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem.